Good morning, everybody. Uh, my topic is not fluid response, but it's non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, so, before we start, we'll just give a small layout of what we'll be talking about. One is an introduction. We'll just compare why a non-invasive can be better with an invasive method, the various modalities that you might have. Uh, we'll talk in a bit detail about two uh, modalities. One is bioreactance or bioimpedance and echocardiography and some high yield pawns in the end. So now before we even start or think of a fancy monitor, what is the first thing you'll have to go as our teachers here, Dr. Sambit and Manimala Madam, everybody, what they tell us. First, always look at the basics. This is something which I found very nice in a video where he said the no base, best non-invasive monitor is the patient himself or herself. They will tell you first because we are uh, clinically, we are not really doing much. So first we need to look, listen and feel to the patient and look at the primary signs where any where in here basically in the signs of hyperperfusion to look for the skin, if it's cold, clammy, cyanotic, uh, look for the gut, how the sounds, if it's decreased, increased aspirate, all signs, look for secondary signs including increased respiratory rate, decreased saturation, decreased urine output, the color changing and finally on the brain and the heart. So the these are the things that you need to remember. And second, most important, I think that same topic will be getting reiterated with you. That is fluid responsive patient. So always the, uh, the point is, remember this trial, the fluid responsive evaluation sepsis hypotension shock, which is called as a fresh. So the main point is in below, that is the interpretation where he says personalized dynamic fluid responsiveness and monitoring. That is what we should aim at. Should never take a patient as the previous one, every patient is unique and we need to assess accordingly. So now uh, let us enter the main talk, that is the introduction. So why are we talking about non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring? One, it's the most evolving, fastest evolving, fastest changing modality in monitoring. We are seeing so many new monitors keep coming in. And main reason is we want things to be safer, we want them with fewer complications and most importantly easy to use. Because we just want, we are used to the plug and play kind of a life and that's what we would want in our monitorings also. So now if you see this busy slide, uh, what you can see is there are a lot of uh, monitors. If you see the cardiac out plus, if you see the invasives are all the plus. So you can see so many are primarily more than 50% developing monitors and all tend to be non-invasive type. So now are they really that good that you're developing so many of them? So if you look at it now, uh, the invasive thing once again. Yeah. So if you look at the invasive methods, what are you worried about? The complications. So there are it's a procedural complication and the secondary infections associated with it. So in non-invasive, we know that it's going to be simple. There'll be complications will be limited. There'll be a possibility of managed measurement can be continuous to intermittent. And Accuracy, the main problem with invasive and non-invasive here, so the main non-invasive will have a problem is it is safer, it is easy to use, but do we have the problem comes in accuracy and precision? Do we have the best part? Not yet, but it is developing. And can it be used in our critical care patients? So again, this is a, a review article in 2021 which said no, but I would not, I don't completely agree with that. But yes, this can be, this is a limitation that we need to look at. Rest of things are pretty general where the indications and the contraindications go. So if you look at this slide where he's talking about the non-invasive methods that are available to us. So if you look at them, he has classified them into few uh, types. One is the bioimpedance, bioreactance type, the CO2 breathing type, the ultrasonic, the pulse wave and the inductance. We will look into it more detail but in this slide what is important is they have tested all these things in the ICU setting and they have seen that there is some uh, amount of precision and there is uh, help in these cases. So now let us enter the main thing, the various modalities. One, what we call as the bioimpedance or the bioreactance. Now this bioimpedance was first described in aeronautical uh, medicine almost 50 years ago. It basically involves delivery of a low amplitude, high frequency electric current across the thorax and received voltage by the electrodes. So what is it? The impedance, what they call, is defined as the ratio of uh, voltage by current and the baseline, it is the ratio of the maximum values and is closely related to the change in the thoracic content. So what basically happens is in the presence of flow through the iota, this impedance value changes over time proportional to the increase in the water and iron located in the chest and thus to increase in the blood value. 
So traditionally, what's the difference? There are the process basically is the same, but the impedance and uh, bioreactants work in a different, slight different manner. One is the bioimpedance systems use amplitude modulation as a signal, whereas bioreactants uses a frequency modulation and phase shifts. So this is a graphic, so you can see there are two currents, the voltage and the current, which will keep going through the chest, through the electrodes, and we are looking for the shifts. So these are the signals that will uh, come out of them, the AM and the FEM signal, and we'll correlate them. So now let us look at the one machine which you would be seeing in your workshop now, that is the Starling bio machine from Baxter. So here what we did talk is the Starling machine works in the same manner. So what they do, they we place two electrodes, up and down, one is the inner ones and the outer ones, over the chest, it creates a kind of a shield, and through that shield the current is flowing, and now the machine will decide what to do. So what does it do? Now if you look at this, the starring stroke volume, it is current is applied through the thorax, the starring detects the time delay between the applied current and the voltage in the test chest. Uh, the time delay of phase shift changes as the blood is going in and out in a pulsatile manner, and this time delay is measured as a unit of volume. And as a flow signal is derived from this time delay, we get a maximum a flow, a DX by maximum flow to this, we get a ventricular ejection from this, and we get a heart rate from the ECG signal. So once the machine gets all this data, what does it do? It uh, applies this formula, the DX by DT into VET, that will be your stroke volume, and stroke volume into heart rate is your cardiac output. So now, validation of this uh, bioreactance. Well, uh, Benamar et al. showed that the NICOM system could predict flow response accurately from changes in cardiac output during passive leg raising. In another study of three ICUs, Ravel et al. reported a good bias of minus 0.09 to LOF of 2.4 liters per Starling system, closely tracking the changes with the thermodilation technique. So with the gold standard, you are able to see some amount of validation Bioreactants, uh, this was another study, which showed that bioreactants predict, reliably predicts preload responsiveness by the end expiratory occlusion test when averaging and refresh times are shortened. So if you modify this machine, you can still get a good uh, validity. Again, another test where they use a bioreactants and fourth generation pulse contour methods, that is a flow track and methods, and they have found that they could get a reasonable uh, similarity. Now, what are the issues? So any non universal the main problem is the limitations. So the limitations what you might face is one is severe physical and anatomical hypothesis are required, limiting this effectiveness. So most of the problem if the patient has an added dissection, any prosthesis or the hemocrit is very low, or when the pulmonary artery pressure is elevated or of any physical abnormalities, any chest abnormalities, this may not be as validated. Other type, one we see is a partial CO2 rebreathing system. So now what this does is applies the fixed, prin fixed principles to exhale gas, measuring the cardiac output by assessing the oxygen consumption and the difference between the arterial and the venous blood contents. So the common uh, one we have seen is the NICO sensor. So what does it do? Basically, if you see in this slide, it uh, takes the car uh, CO2, there is a rebreathing valve, which is volume which is inactive. During the active valve, it measures the carbon dioxide changes, it, it measures that changes, and again the rebreathing valve becomes inactive and it's open. So during this change, the delta change is measured and it's able to give you a output. Now the problem with this is, because it is based on the CO2, the smallest variation in the CO2 can lead to significant differences in cardiac output measurements. The changes in the ventilation may modify the entire CO2, requiring the respiratory state to be steady, difficult sometimes in our critical care patients, and main problem is differences in the VCO2 and entire CO2 only account for a part of the lung which is ventilated, especially in our case if there's atelectasis or collapse, these tissues will come. So in an application wise, it is limited. The next what you can see is the pulse wave transit time. So pulse wave transit time is the time required for the pulse pressure wave to travel between two points. So it can be estimated from the interval between the development of the R wave of the electrogram to the peripheral detection. So as you can see, the R wave starts until the pulse wave is able to reach. So this is the time, transit time, that's what we are going to measure. So it is then considered, because it's a time and the velocity, so it becomes inversely correlated to the velocity and to the volume. So with increasing blood pressure, increasing arterial distending pressure, increasing compliance, pulse velocity increases, and the PWTD shortens, hence it is suggested as surrogate marker of blood pressure changes. And the machine which can be done with is the ESCO. There are two main issues here. One is the heterogeneity of the patient's profile, which an overall algorithm may be required. 
and the interpatient variability in the course of his treatment because of any, again, as we said, with any non invasive any hypovolemia, vasoconstriction, vasodilatation, these would be seen. Then next, uh, another method is called inductance thoracocardiography. Uh, this allows the computation of ventricular volume curves from ECG triggered uh, ensemble respiratory waveform of an inductive plethosmic transducer. So this transducer is positioned in front of the heart, heartbeat related ventricular volume variations are detected and they are adjusted according to respiration related impedance signals and give you a computing specific cardiac change. So this is done by a trace, basically it uses two methods, the impedance and the ECG. The limitation here is, the main limitation in the fact is it only detects relative variations cardiac volumes and at least one calibration per patient is required. And if the thoracic compliance is low, volume variations can be undetectable. So there are many limitations with this methods. Newer methods that are coming in, one is the Litco LXI system, where as we said, something where we record just a plug and play kind of a thing. So they use the Appalachian tonometry methods where you're able to get the system. So what they do is they pressure, it gets a compliance correction, it gets, it correlates the waveform, does another autocorrelation, it, through the algorithm, it calibrates through their uh, uh, pulse CO algorithm and then you get a cardiac output and the variation. So similar to these are like the Litco is a clear side system by Edwards. This also follows a similar way. As you can see, there's inflammatory bla inflatable bladder and they have the light detector of plethysmography. It uses both these methods to transduce the, and it uses the NIBP and it traces the uh, brachial to the finger and you can get a cardiac output through this. Same thing is done by the CNAP system, which is from another CNA system, that is an American, this is a European brand. So, coming to another used is ultrasonic methods. Here we use the product of the aortic blood flow velocity and area of suction of the area of section of the aorta equals to the cardiac output. And the blood flow velocity can be measured using the ultrasound and the Doppler effect. So, a machine which is usually used is the use a US COM device. This is mainly used in uh, children and there was a validation of three invasive tests where they had used uh, SCOM with the PA catheter and they could find a reliability. So now the limitations again, you know, there's uh, the difficulty in keeping the Doppler probe in a steady position in a critical care patient, the lack of echogenity in some patients, especially in cardiac surgery and the relate reliability of the valve area estimation based on age tends to decrease with population age. So as the age increases, this reliability starts coming down. So now let's come to the final thing or the most important which all of us need to know and all of us need to follow that is echocardiography. Echocardiography is no longer a monitor now, it's a clinical skill that everybody needs to know how to use, how to utilize and at the bedside. So as you know echo can do many things, it can detect why a patient is dyspneic, it can detect the cause of hypotension, the chest pain and it can do so many things and it is helpful in diagnosing, in therapeutic and in preventing. So now this is a slide which all of us need to fo focus on. One is how the echo is going to help us. As you know with the positive uh, pressure varied ventilation, you can see the arterial waveform changes which has already been discussed with you, spoken about the PA delta up and delta down and the pulse pressure variations. The same thing will get replicated once on the echo when we check for the when VTI or the velocity time integral where we check for the maximum minimum velocity. We can again Check the same with the IVC M mode with the distensibility or the variability index which can show you during the positive where you can see it is low and it is in the peak it will go higher. But when you are looking for the SVC, if you are instead of IVC, if you look at the XVC, the picture changes. It becomes reverse of the IVC. Why this happens, we will have a look little ahead. So on the echo, once you are looking at it, before you really go for the VTI and everything, first we need to assess the volume status. One, as we said, look at the patient clinically. And then on the echo, when we see the LV size, the size of LV is predicted only for fluid responsive, only when it is very small. So remember that the size of the LV is predicted only when it is very small. A hyperonic LV with end diastric area less than 10 centimeters or papillary opposition of the ventricles or the or the, what we call as the kissing ventricles is a strong indicator of hypovolemia. But remember, these changes can also be found in elevated hypertrophy, highly inotropic and vasodilated states. So it may not be the right answer and you might always see that in patients with HOCM, hypovolemia might actually accentuate the obstruction and can be fatal. And so we need to keep a close watch of the significant narrowing of the outflow tract by underfilling and especially in a hypovolemic patient. 
So one we have to look at the LV. Next, more important, we need to look at the end diastolic LV and diastolic pressures. So main problem is half the time this gets underdiagnosed or under evaluated, and we need to check that, understand that any diastolic changes or restrictive pattern in the mitral valve flow should prompt caution in fluid administration, as it reflects a elevated left LV diastolic pressure. So this LV can be underfilled despite high filling pressures. So it will always show that there is a Re poor relaxation. So it is very difficult to predict the LV might be underfilled, although showing high pressures. And because of this kind of a balance, it is sometimes the range of how much of fluid you can give becomes very narrow for the speed of which how you want to go, that has to be checked. Next is the R right ventricular size. The right ventricular size can easily dilate and accommodate volume, but it is intolerant to pressure loading. So our so what we need to keep, any patient with RV dilatation, let's say with pulmonary embolism, do come with shock, have one show increase in stroke volume with the fluid challenge, but a dilated RV should prompt a caution in fluid administration. Why is that? So increase in RV size with no increase, why? Because here you can see any, if the dilatation of the RV, it can always, because you can see the both, in the, both the chambers are interconnected, so there will be some amount of pressure shift to the left and that will indirectly reduce the problem, increase the LV problem. So an increase in RV size with no increase in stroke volume, definitely stopping point for fluid administration. And sometimes RV failure sometimes can show up as false positives for fluid responsiveness. Next, now coming to the, when we're talking about fluid responsiveness, we need to look for the LV outflow track and look for the stroke volume variation. Here we took by two methods. One, we need to check for the, uh, LV uh, 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 diameter, when we check with the iota in the uh, plaques mode, and we look for the uh, LV output track diameter, and we check for the, in the phi apical phi chamber with the pulse wave, we check for the LVOT, which we take for the VTI. So once we get these measures, we take a flow, that is the VTI into the surface area or the LVOT. So decreasing the speed flow will allow the aortic flows to be seen over uh, more than one respiratory cycle. Tracing the largest and the smallest VTA over the respiratory cycle allows this percentage to be calculated. So this variation will come by the formula 100 into uh, stroke volume max minus min minus minute by minimum divided by max plus minimum into 0.5. Same thing if you are, because you have to calculate the area and then we have to look for the variation, we can always check for the aortic peak velocity also at the same we can increase the speed and you can check for the peak velocity and always look for the variation in those uh, in the uh, peak velocity. Now the limitations when you are doing these kind of methods, one is in any echo method, it is the inter-observer and intra-observer reliability and it is always operator dependent. And with any heart-lung interaction, there is a limitation to how you can uh, check. So there are, there is a small, uh, uh, thing which you have shown, when is basically what is R limit. So anywhere with the right-sided heart failure, low heart rates, low respiratory rate, irregular cardiac rhythm, mechanical ventilation, low tidal volumes, increased abdominal pressure, thorax is open and in spontaneous breathings, you might get a false negative to a false positive kind of a picture. Now when this kind of situation arises, there is always one answer for you, that is the passive leg raising or the virtual fluid challenge, which will help you through this. So there are two methods to go about this. One is method A, where you can see, and there is a method B. Both can be done and which can help you give a virtual challenge to see. So now what happens? Now this stroke volume or simply the VTA across this outflow track is measured before and one minute after the passive leg raising. You see an increment of 10% and this suggests some about a fluid responsiveness. And then that gives you idea that you can uh, give the patient this fluid. PLR can be performed regardless of the arrhythmia or the mode of ventilation. What we need to understand about passive leg raise, it is not simply positive versus negative. It is a degree of increase in stroke volume to PLR which predicts the parameter response to fluids. And again, as it is again an inter, because we are doing it via echo, it is an inter-observer and inter-observer reliability is there. Issues are there. Next, we can all, as with the echo, we look at the great vessels. So in the great vessels, the IVC side needs to be measured, just distal to the hepatic vein in spontaneous breathing patients, does correlate with uh, right atrial pressures, and a very small IVC suggests that fluid can be tolerated. But again, with positive rate of variation, it does not. Then we need to look at the next type, which is the variations in the diameter. One is we can check for the IVC diameter by putting on the M mode and look for the 
vari variability in this, either we took at the diameter variation, either with a variability index, that is the IVC diameter, which is the D max minus D min by the mean. So if you take a variability, it should be variation more than 12%. But if you take a distensibility index, which is another form of the same, we look at the D max by D divided by D minimum. So that time, because the minimum goes to the uh, denominator, the distensibility index uh, goes up, so it is more than 18%. Next, with the IVC, another vessel which you can help is the SVC. The SVC variation is difficult to see with the transthoracic, so it is can be visualized with the transesophageal in a longitudinal 90 to 100 degree view. So the diameter changes are opposite to the IVC, as we said. The SVC partially collapses in the mechanical inspiration, and as the increase in pleural pressure is greater than the increase in right atrial pressure during a positive breath. So this collapsibility index has been shown to be predictive, predictive of uh, fluid responsive with a variation of almost 36%. So now once you've got an LV, we got the vessels, we got the LVOT, how do you put it all together? So this is a slide from, uh, it's a very good article on the BJ Education. I would uh, encourage everybody to read it. So what it says is look for signs of overt hypovolemia and fluid challenge. So clinically we can see that there is amount of hypovolemia, look for any, the vent kissing ventricles, any small hyperkinetic LV or right ventricles and a collapsible IVC. So this shows that patient is volume depleted and may need fluid. So next what? We review for any presence of the following conditions. So what are these conditions which will define what we do next? One is any arrhythmias, valvular conditions, RV failures, LV failure, diastolic heart failure, any low tidal volume ventilation, or we look for the spontaneous breathing. Based on that, we need to decide what to do next. If any or none of these conditions are present, we go consider a fluid challenge, we indicate clinically, we give, we check for the stroke wall variation or the LVOT VTI velocity variation or the LVOT velocity beat to beat variation, or we look for the distensibility index. If these changes are correct, we can give the fluids, but if none of the above criteria met, but clinically still you feel some amount of fluid is required, then you might uh, consider giving a mini fluid challenge, which is 100 ml of fluid over one minute, and we check for the VTI change. If there is a change, we can continue the fluid. Or let's say there are arrhythmias and eddy conditions where we might not be able to use this heart-lung uh, interaction, we can go for the PLR and look for the changes in the LVOT. If there is a change, then you can give some fluid. But again, once you are giving a fluid, it's not just giving a fluid and uh, that's the end of the story. We need to again reassess the patient, check the uh, LV filling pressures, the endoastric pressures, and keep making sure that we don't push the patient from a hypovolemic state to the hypervolemic or overload state. And we need to repeat these steps until it is no longer indicated, or you have to look for any other kinds of shock, if it's not just hypovolemic and may need any vasoactive drugs. And if this continues or we need a more continuous evaluation, maybe con consider a continuous cardiac output monitoring because it may not be able to feasible to do it all the time. So in the end, the points I would want you to focus on right here is the future is non-unism monitoring because we want things to be faster, easier. So they will be coming in more numbers. When any doubt, when you are not sure what to do, whether the fluid is given or not, just give a uh, PLR, just do a passive leg raise. It will give you an idea of how the patient might behave and we can consider ahead. When using a non invest device, first remember its limitations, always, because there are always problems with it and they are, use, they are useful only in specific conditions. And many times in our ICU, sometimes they might not be useful, but yes, we are still the limitations and then use them. And any parameter that you use, never use it in isolation. So always look for the entire picture of the, not just the BTI, look for the LV, RV, look for the IVC, and then get a complete picture of how the patient might behave, and then move ahead. Yeah, thank you.